everybody. Welcome back to another segment of the Renegade Revolution. In this episode, I am interviewing Nathan Fant of the Organ BDR. The Organ BDR was just released for this year, and actually the film came out just a few weeks ago. So Nathan and I sit down, we talk about what went into creating this BDR, what to expect from the different types of organ terrain, and what to prepare for as an ADV and dual sport rider. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Nathan. He's an amazing guy. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, as always, live wild, ride free. Cool. Perfect. Um, hi. Oh my gosh. First of all, how are you? It's so good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you too. Where are you at? Yeah. Um, I'm actually in Bend right now, um, okay. just for a couple of days. I had free time for once, which is nice. And so I um, I came back here and got to visit friends and stuff, but I'll be out of here in a couple of days. So just kind of enjoying it while I'm here. But yeah. yeah you've had a here. whirlwind of travel uh, and adventure. Dude, it's been crazy. But <laughs> um, yeah. Where are you still in Portland? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't quite make it home. I... Uh... <laughs> I got stuck on a technical problem at work and I'm still oh, here at work. Really? Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, been there plenty of times. Trust me. Um, cool. Well, if you're ready to get started, we can get rolling. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, awesome. Um, so uh, ADV Moto Mag essentially has kind of brought me on to do some interviews with people that are working in the adventure motorcycle riding industry and um, people that are essentially bringing a lot more of a unique um, aspect to uh, motorcycle riding. And you obviously, after creating the organ BDR, are somebody that's at the top of that list. So um, essentially what I kind of want to get into is first kind of talk a little bit about you and your background and what you like to do with adventure riding. Then we'll talk about the BDR and then that's pretty much it. Um, but yeah, so first up, um, for starters, um let's talk about just the bikes that you ride so what biker bikes do you kind of keep in the garage to take out um on the weekend you know what type of terrain do you enjoy most and um you know how often are you getting out I'm pretty sure you're a diligent weekend warrior from what I can tell yeah definitely um I've got a KTM 500 EXE uh that I absolutely adore and love yeah. and uh that bike is like I consider it kind of my dirt bike with added you know being able to get out and do a little bit of motor camping close to home. Um, consider that kind of like my within the state of Oregon kind of bike. And then yeah. when I want to go further abroad, I actually have a, a KTM 790 Adventure R. That's sort of more my like travel bike. Um, yeah. Although it gets relegated to sometimes accidentally doing trails on <laughs> not on purpose anyway. But Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then as far as like terrain, um, you know, I, I kind of enjoy it all. Um, yeah. I'm not opposed to doing a long, you know, motorcycle highway trip. Um, that doesn't bother me last year when I was scouting um, on one of the future BDRs that yeah. I can't mention right here. I mean, <laughs> uh, I rode my motorcycle across many state lines and camp along the way. And it was like, like the perfect combination of you know, riding to the trailhead and then, you know, doing some scouting and then riding a couple days home. And right. Um, I don't know. I just like it all. I like anything from single track to, you know, two track to long highway trips. It's all good. I mean, as long as I'm on a motorcycle, all things are good. Yeah. I feel like that's kind of, um, I'm one of those as well. Like, you know, when you're kind of a diehard and you love being on two wheels, it's just kind of any opportunity to get on ride is the best opportunity. So I'm with you on that. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think for me, if it's not a bike that can, can't go on the, let me rephrase that. If it's a bike that can't go on the dirt, I'm not as interested in it. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Like I've owned sport bikes and I've owned, um, well, mostly sport bikes, I guess. Uh, and, you know, once you discover dual sporting and adventure motorcycling and dirt biking and stuff, it's like, yeah, I like the street part, but if it doesn't also do the dirt part, I don't really want to, I mean, it's not like a bad thing. It's a motorcycle, but I don't, I'm right. not like in love with it. Yeah, no, totally understand that. I mean, uh, I did a lot of highway this summer and um, it got to a point where anytime we got to get off-road, it was like heaven because you just, it does yeah. get, um, for those of us that are lucky to get off-road a lot, being on the road does tend to get tedious sometimes. So I, uh, I can relate to that a hundred percent. 
Um, and yeah, you get out with Chris pretty often. Do you guys, is it just the two of you a lot or do you guys have a group you get out with? Um, well, I mean, we, we ride together a lot. Yeah. I mean, the main thing is, is that, you know, we've, it's part of kind of our relationship. And so, yeah. um, our first ride together, uh, big ride anyway, was our honeymoon. Um, we took a motorcycle trip from Seattle, Washington, where we got married all the way down to the Pacific coast highway. Um, we tried to follow the coastline as much as possible all the way down to San Diego. And yeah. then we turned back and came through the Mojave desert and just sort of more did more of an inland route. And that was like, um, two weeks on the bikes and that sort of kicked off, you know, cause that was Chris's like six month anniversary as to riding a motorcycle for the first time. So that was a really big deal for her and That's her skills got, yeah, yeah, huge accomplishment. Her skills gained so much in that, you know, two weeks. So right. we ride together a lot. Um, but also we've got kind of a group of core friends that we like to ride with. I mean, you've met a lot of them, but, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, Tim, uh, Travis, Ben, you know, just kind of that core group of Oregon, uh, dual sport moto YouTubers. <laughs> Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's so funny. You know, I, I obviously love those guys so much. It's, uh, it's nice to feel like there's, um, a pretty tight knit Oregon community of people and everybody kind of knows each other and can get in touch and get out and ride together when, when, you know, the weather isn't too terrible, but, um, it's, it's a pretty great ADV community they have around here. It's, it's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah that's, I mean, it, you can't really beat it if your partner uh, rides with you, you know, that kind of makes life a little bit more fun, I think. Yeah, you know, it's like having a riding buddy all the time. Um, yeah. Like, what are we doing this weekend? Well, we're riding motorcycles, obviously. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's just more yeah. of uh, what's next. And um, so speaking of that, um, what is your favorite BDR of all time that you've ri ridden so far that you can at least share with me? Um, because as so, I know you've done quite a bit of that yourself, so I would love to know which one you enjoyed the most. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I I've done a number of BDRs, and they're all amazing. So I, it's kind of like picking your favorite child. You yeah, know? I kind of figured that was going to be your response. <laughs> <laughs> but there is one for me anyway that stands um, in my interest of motorcycling and it meets what I like about motorcycling the best. Um, and I think that's the magic of the BDRs is that each state give, I mean, the BDR itself gives you what it is in the state of riding. How do I phrase yeah. that better? Um, the state offers up what it has to offer. And so yeah. the BDR has to follow along the terrain that's in the state for the climate and environment that you're riding in. And so for me, I'm a desert guy and Southern California for me is just like perfection, heaven, love it. Um, I've yeah. already done the route twice and I, I'm crazy, but I, I might do it again <laughs> I guess a awesome. third time. So I mean, um, yeah, that's great. But also the Colorado BDR is really amazing. Um, the, uh, what is it called? All the passes. Um, I'm having a brain fart moment here. <laughs> That's all right. The, the Alpine Loop. Yeah. Um, so yeah. with all the um, with all those high mountain passes, just so beautiful, and you know some of them are really rocky and and technical, and I like that part of it. But I also really like yeah. the reward when you yeah. climb that rocky climb. That's really difficult, and you get up to the top of a peak, and you can get that great viewpoint at the top. Take a little break, maybe grab a snack or something like that. Feeling of accomplishment that you get when you're at the top of something like that. Colorado really delivers on that part. Um, actually, the upcoming Northern California BDR is going to be really exciting too, because it's something that uh, is going to be more approachable for folks who maybe just bought their first um, adventure bike and they want to go and try it out and they've yeah. taken some training and stuff and they want to go um, test it out because that route's going to be like 50% pavement, 50% kind of groomed gravel. Yeah. So, but very beautiful. And um, lots of historic stuff. So that route, like I said, it's like every route has its own like flavor and, and spice and, um, unique attractions that you can see along the way. And I, I don't know, it's really hard to pick one. Yeah. <laughs> really oh, for hard. sure. 
I, I had a feeling that it was going to be, uh, I mean, because that is kind of the beauty of the BDRs is they really do capture the best of the area that they're in. And yeah. uh, I, I'm, I mean, I haven't done enough BDRs to form an opinion on this myself, but Colorado is very high on my list because of the Alpine Loop and and a lot of those very like scenic, picturesque viewpoints. So um, it's kind of like what makes it the reward of getting through some of that technical terrain. And I think sometimes is having that incredible view at the top and um, being able to take all of it in of how far you've come. So, yeah. Yeah. And don't discount Utah too, because I didn't, when before I did that one, I didn't know that rocks could be beautiful, but yeah. Utah has some beautiful rock formations and you can ride anywhere in that state. It is so motorcycle friendly. Um, so yeah. Utah is, I mean, that's another awesome one. So yeah, it's yeah. hard to pick. Adding, adding to the list, that's for sure. It's growing fast. Um, I mean, that's just the nice thing is I, I feel like as an off-road rider, you do kind of have an endless amount of terrain that you can tap into. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's really wonderful. Um, all right. So we're going to dive into the Oregon stuff. And obviously, I know you're limited with what you can tell me. So just answer, you know, as best you can. Um, so, well, you know, I mean, I, I can tell you any and all things. Um, we just can't share that information until after February 4th. So cool. feel free That's to ask great. me any questions. Um, I don't think this is going to run until March anyway. So that should actually work out perfect. Um, yeah. So basically, um, all right, let's get through that. Uh, what can you tell me about and, and share as much as you want with this? What can you tell me about how you built this route? Like, why did you choose the terrain you did? Um, if you had an objective in mind for creating it and, uh, you know, from what I can tell, a lot of the hype around this is that this might be one of the coolest BDRs to date. So talk to me about just really what went into creating it. What were you thinking? And, um, you know, just overall vibe of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so point of clarity. Uh, I was one of two people who were considered route architects on the Oregon route. And so yeah. I would be remiss without mentioning Bryce Stevens. He's mm -hmm. the original brainchild for this route. He Back in 2016, he um, originally sort of rough, roughly sketched where, it wants, where he wanted it to go. Okay. And if you're not familiar with Bryce Stevens, he is a mapping genius. He actually does mapping um, as his like profession. He owns a company. Yeah, and he's really, really good at it. So um, I can't take full credit for the Oregon route, but I can take, you know, a lot of the scouting once he kind of roughly laid it out um, as sort of like I did a lot of the refinement on it. Yeah, yeah. And and so I just want to mention that, like, it's always a team effort at the BDR and nobody's ever like one person takes all responsibility for everything. But anyway. I just wanted me to make sure. Yeah, um, of course, absolutely. Totally. So um, my thought process behind the Oregon BDR, given the, you know, that we already kind of knew sort of the towns that we wanted to hit from Bryce's 2016 scouting expedition was, because I was, I joined the team in 2019. Um, we went out on another scouting trip, really trying to refine, um, we call it finding the BDR gold or the really good stuff. Mm -hmm. And um the important piece there is to find stuff that's big bike friendly so that somebody that, you know, who is an intermediate rider on a big adventure motorcycle, fully loaded with camping gear, can go out and reasonably tackle the main route. Um, yeah. We're looking for terrain that is, brings you through beautiful scenery and high elevation and public land and all that stuff. We wanna be able to take people to viewpoints and see interesting historic towns along the way. And so that's really the goal of any BDR. And finding that stuff in Oregon, like I said, the state offers up what it has to offer. And um, starting in the southern part of the route, um, southeast Oregon really offers up these little tiny um, farming towns that are usually mm -hmm. like, um, you know, uh, cattle ranches and yeah. those tiny communities that really serve cattle ranchers to be honest that's about it that's down there um you've been to southeast oregon before and you know what it's like it's just yeah. super sparse and remote southeast oregon is actually one of the most remote places in the country in the lower Absolutely. 48 yeah and so we had the trouble we had out there was 
not necessarily you know finding one route through it was like picking between like 15 or 20 different routes to find like the really good stuff that's scenic and remote and takes you to cool places um gives you optional expert options for folks who we're calling them harder harder options now because of lawyers <laughs> yeah yeah um, sure. yeah uh, but the main thing is, is that, you know, we, finding the attractions in the small towns and the gas and, you know, services along the way and those small communities, it's like you're kind of stuck with one or two town options because they're so sparse out there. Yeah. And then as, as you work your way north, um, we wanted to give folks this sort of transition in the route from high desert southeast Oregon to central Oregon with the pine forests and um, sort of that lava, you know, lava uh, domes and, um, you know, what Central Oregon is all about is that volcanic, volcanic um, terrain. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then transitioning from Central Oregon's volcanic terrain to um, the Cascade Mountain Range, which gives you that forest experience. And the yeah. Oregon route is really like three routes in one. So you get like the Southeast Oregon remote cattle ranch experience. You get the Central Oregon with its kind of hot springs and volcanic history and the cool pine yeah. forests and then you get the the cascade mountains with the doug fir trees and the pines and you know all the huge volcanic mountains so and mountain peaks um it is really a spectacular route and really gives you that sense of hey i'm traveling through this state through these different ecosystems and seeing new things yeah that sounds awesome um i mean and that's one of my favorite parts about Oregon is just that I feel, and after being here for a lot of years, it's just, it's all the terrain we have. It's the desert, it's the rainforest, it's the mountains. I mean, we have everything here. It's incredible. And uh, especially as a motorcycle rider and an ADV rider, getting to hit all of those things in one BDR just sounds like an incredible thrill ride. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, so kind of theming off that, um, what do you feel like a lot of writers should expect? Like, how do you think it compares challenge wise with the other BDRs to date? And, um, you know, going into it, like, what are kind of those, um, those things to, to pump yourself up before you hop into something that is probably going to be a little more challenging of a BDR? Yeah, um, I haven't done the Northeast BDR, but I'm told that, uh, Southern California and the Northeast BDR, at least the um, the main route, they did Northeast a little bit differently. They put like the expert stuff on the main route and then the easier workarounds. I'm not sure. I don't know the thought process behind that, but what we're doing in Oregon is we're making a main route that's the easier route. And then there's going to be optional, harder expert sections. Cool. And so that's the way it's laid out. And um, the reason I mentioned SoCal and Northeast is that those are kind of considered the two hardest BDRs. And I yeah. would say that Oregon is probably um, somewhere in there, but maybe not quite as hard as SoCal. Yeah. Um, like I said, I haven't done Northeast. Some of the things that people are going to have to prepare for when they do Oregon is the remoteness. They're really going to have to be self-sufficient, um, bringing like tools and, you know, tubes and everything you need yeah. to fix your bike and all the supplies that you need to like, you know, stay alive. Because um, when we were filming, we got a flat in the middle of the desert and we weren't that far from town, but the issue was that um, there's just no way to, to ride the bike on a flat into town on the terrain that we we're riding. So you right. have to have all the stuff that you need to fix it there. And it was a hundred degrees. It was baking hot and we were pouring sweat yeah. Changing a flat tire in that situation. I mean, it's, you have to be prepared with plenty of water, all the tools you need to fix your bike, all that stuff. Um, yeah. And a satellite messenger too. I mean, that's going to be super remote. Um, yeah, absolutely. Writing technical terrain wise, like as far as skills go, specific things that people are going to want to play, um, not, not play, but, you know, to look to practice and or get training on is um I think play because it's like the first word that comes to my mind is that yeah. when I train I play <laughs> yeah for sure so, I feel the same way so I yeah. get it yeah <laughs> um uh silt is a problem in the southern part of the route yeah. Yeah. um if you've been out to southeast Oregon you know about it uh there are silt beds out there that will catch you by surprise you 
you, you got to be ready for them and they'll swallow your front tire and they'll we yeah. used to call it, we called it during the filming we called it getting swappy in the poof <laughs> that's a great way to describe it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and uh um rocks there's a there's rock beds with a lot of the stuff that we're going through in southeast oregon are actually like volcanic rock beds and and right. there's embedded um they're baby heads essentially baby head boulder fields that you're going through and you're going to be riding those for many miles at a time yeah. so just getting used to being really loose on the bike so that you know that bouncing up and down and up and down and up and down isn't totally wearing you out and you're letting right. kind of the bike move around underneath you yeah absolutely. um yeah, and then um, there's a few climbs that are, um, I wouldn't say ridiculously steep, but I would say that the main route has a yeah. couple of climbs here and there. So just getting used to riding uphill is important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, we all like to think we're great at hills, but every once in a while, if you're not ready for it, it can catch you by surprise. That's for sure. Yep. Um, awesome. I mean, it sounds like quite the adventure. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to getting out there myself. I mean, um, why, so why do you think, and th this is, uh, this is something that I kind of, um, cause BDRs are something that resonates so hard in the ADV community. And so why do you think that BDR routes just continue to be on the bucket list? Like, is it just because of the effort that goes into creating them and, you know, how unique each one kind of is, you know, what makes these routes so special for exploring, um, I mean, a lot of it, I think, probably comes from the effort that you and the BDR team kind of put into creating them in the first place. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons. I don't think there's, you can pin it down to one specific thing. Um, but thinking from the general public's perspective, why BDR is so successful with the general public, and I, th I think that is because of the turnkey experience that we, it's like a self-guided tour. Right. And folks can download tracks for free, which I think is important. Offering these GPS tracks for people on the internet for free is really important to the BDR. Yeah. Um, it shows a lot of goodwill to the community and gives them something to go and say, hey, you know what? I had a really good time on this BDR. I wanna come back and do another one, but this time I wanna support the BDR because I've had such a good time. Yeah. Um, and I think also partnering with Butler Maps, their um, motorcycle maps are incredibly detailed. They so show you all the cool stuff along the route, stuff you want to do and stay at. There's, you know, where are the hotels, the, the food, the gas stops, where are the difficult sections. I remember looking at the SoCal, SoCal BDR Butler map specifically about 15 times, seeing the section where it says eight miles of deep sand and thinking, holy shit, what are we getting ourselves into? Yeah. And yeah. that that memory of, of the Butler map is like burned into my brain thinking about this. And then we got through it and it was like, oh, no big deal. Like, why right. was I so worried about this? But I had the heads up. And I think that's the value in the BDR. Yeah. And Butler maps and the tracks and the website with all the information and just all of this like preloaded data about this trip that you can have is that, you know, yeah. hey, you know what? We're going to give you something where you know what to expect more or less. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that that's definitely uh, something that a lot of us enjoy. I mean, I, I know for myself, I love getting out with bigger groups. It's really fun, but being able to do that element of a self-guided anything is such a cool concept. Um, you know, so if you do have a partner like you have Chris, you know, you guys can get out and do whatever you want to do and do a camping trip, the two of you, or you can get out with the team. Like I know you guys are doing the summer to do the BDR and kind of knock it all out at once. You know, it's just, it's such a, a beautiful element of motorcycle riding and adventuring that uh, BDR and the Butler maps, I think just do so well together. Um, yeah, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with that <laughs> one. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I guess uh, final thing is just, do you have anything that you want to add about the Oregon BDR, like your favorite part, like anything you thought was super special about it? Um, like as a whole, on a personal level, I think it's like this, you only get so many opportunities in life to like have a calling and, right. you know, for this world to say, Hey, this knock on your door and say, Hey, this opportunity is like really special and you should be a, definitely do whatever it takes to make this happen. And I think this was like one of those up there with maybe like 
having a child or being married or you know what I mean those yeah, big absolutely. moments in your life where you're like this is a call to action and I felt personally like I'm really proud of it you know I, it's, it's it going to be something yeah. that people are really going to like I put a lot of effort into it and I don't mind it's fun effort but it is effort and yeah. um, it's just one of those calling experiences but specifically like what what people are probably going to want to know <laughs> is yeah. Um, what are what is the cool stuff that like what are the highlight um, points on the BD, on the Oregon BDR that they're really going to enjoy? Um, you know, if you're into the harder stuff, um, all of almost all the harder stuffs are out or, out and back. So yeah, you're going out to a viewpoint and you're turning around and coming back. So um, the harder section in section one go, takes you to the top of Beatty, Beatty's Butte. Mm -hmm. And you see that a little bit in the, the film teaser, the trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is an incredible viewpoint at the top. You can see to, to the horizon in all directions. And um, the climb up there is no joke. <laughs> it's like three miles of steep, rocky climbing. But once you get to the top, it is like that ultimate feeling of reward. And, you know, you just get this amazing view and all 360 and you can, you know, high five your buddies because you all made it up or yeah. maybe you had to help push each other's bikes up or something like that. But, you know, yeah. it's just it's just such an awesome experience. And there are a number of those on the route. I think pretty much all of them are um, like viewpoints that you can get up to. Yeah. Uh, another one I'm thinking of um, is uh, Cash Mountain. Mm -hmm. yeah cash mountain is one of those um it's it's kind of well known in the ohv stuff but um you know to taking a big adventure bike up there it's actually quite a challenge to get up there because of the loose silt because of the rocks because right. of the loose rocks and the volcanic stuff it's really hard to get up there but once you do i mean you can see four mountains up there from the top all snowy peak awesome. mountains in every direction you get to see uh three finger jack you get to see um three sisters uh mount washington um i forget what else but um you get to see a whole bunch of mountain ranges all around you and it's just really really cool they're all snow-capped mountain yeah. peaks and yeah it it's just amazing. a really cool experience yeah um, um, sounds absolutely incredible it really yeah. really does and you oh. know the main the main route i don't want to you know for anybody who's not really into doing those really hard things um even the main route there's a lot of really really great stuff to see um, you're not going to be like, gosh, darn it. Why didn't I do the harder stuff? You're, you're not yes. going to be thinking that you're like the main route is amazing. Um, like Southeast Oregon, it has that whole desolate, you know, remote desert, high desert feel where you're just like out in the middle of nowhere. And the yeah. amount of remoteness is pretty, <laughs> it's pretty overtake overwhelming yeah. um, in a good way. Like you're like, man, I am so far from everything. I can just like feel myself calming down and relaxing into this yeah. vacation. And, uh, with central Oregon, you can, you know, you just start to get that transition from like high desert, dusty, um, kind of like sandy stuff to like this more kind of mellow, uh, pine forest experience. And it's like, as you go from South to North, it's like the trees start to call you in. Yeah. You know, you go from like this wide open desert to, to pine trees, to mountains and forest, and it's like the trees are calling you home. And that experience of having the trees and the mountains call me home is really, really special. Like every time I do it, I'm just like, uh, I love the mountains so much. Yeah, that's, I mean, one of my favorite parts of uh, the drive from Bend to Portland is that kind of section where you're coming out of the desert and going back up into the mountains by hood because it is it just like very similar feel right it just sucks you right in there and it's just absolutely stunning and uh, you know Oregon in general I think is one of those last few places that especially around the central part in the southeast it really does feel like the wild west because there isn't anything there and yeah. it's such a cool feeling if you really love to be out in mother nature and be in the elements and and have those experiences and that's just compounded enormously in the best way when you're on a bike it really is there's nothing yeah. like it so it totally is I totally agree with you I also think um moto campers are really going to like this route because there's a yeah. lot of just dispersed camping everywhere and yeah. you know there are campsites but I mean 
if you're into dispersed camping, this is going to be a great route for those folks who like that. Um, awesome. Lots of lakes, lots of high alpine lakes to camp at, lots of rivers. Um, even uh, you can pretty much just camp anywhere on the route. I mean, there's just like no, it's all BLM and, and Forest Service. And so it's just really no restrictions on that, which is a really cool part about Oregon is that you can just yeah. kind of camp anywhere. Yeah, that I mean, the amount of BLM land we have, and, and it's just, it makes dispersed camping and camping in general, just so much fun because you don't really have to worry about it in a lot of areas. You can kind of find your spot, camp out, you know, pack in, pack out. We all need to be responsible, but um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it makes it, I think so much more incredible of an experience when you get to camp on the bike and do it that way. I obviously spend most of my summer and fall doing that. And it's just the absolute best. It's the absolute yeah, best. It, it really is. And for me, like <laughs> we've had some opportunities to camp in campgrounds, established campgrounds recently where it was sort of like, okay, this is what everybody else is doing. It yeah. Just, I'm like, I, I actually, I'm like, I don't really like this <laughs> because yeah, of all the noise, yeah. yeah. you know, I'm just like, this first camping is so great, but I understand why people need it, you know, in their lives, you know, yeah. they need bathrooms and showers and all that. And I don't need those things, but other people do. Yeah. And uh, that's fine. But um, yeah. the dispersed camping is just amazing. Uh, one particular experience that we had on in the filming, and you, you may still see this in the film, is that um, uh, uh, Olali Lake is, is for now, unfortunately, it's an out and back. But once the Forest Service fixes um, the road, see, what happened is like the town of Detroit basically burned down. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with that. Yes, the whole yeah. town basically burned down. Yeah. And that is the end and start of one of the sections on the route. Um, yeah. And so we talk about how important it is as we're passing through the towns to support these towns and bring financial impact to those communities, which right. is also one of the missions of the BDR. Point is, as you're passing through Detroit, you'll notice how much forest is burned down. And the main route actually goes through an area that's currently closed. Um, there's a forest service road that's fantastic for riding. It goes by all these great lakes. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, it's not open for another year to three years, somewhere in that neighborhood while yeah. the forest service reclaims all that timber. And so we had to do a bypass. Anyway, if you're a camper and you're looking for camping, we, I highly recommend a lolly lake because that is, it's, if you've never been there, you, you should go camp there. It's really, really, really beautiful. And then in, in the film, uh, Tim James was like, man, this is an awesome place to camp. Yeah. He, he was really happy with it. So I was glad because I, I got my Tim James approval, <laughs> you know, stamp uh, of approval on the yeah, boss says it's good. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And getting a stamp of approval like that makes you feel pretty good about the work you've done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Totally. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh man. I'm, I'm excited to, to get on a smaller bike and get out there and rip through this. That sounds like so much fun. Um, Ugh. I mean, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, I mean, just kind of seeing how everything plays out in the next couple of months and everything gets released. And um, yeah, are you going to be at Giant Loop in June? Yeah, I'm planning to cool. host the BDR booth there. Awesome. Uh, hopefully I'll have a little more help this year. <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, cool. The booth. All right. Yeah, well, um, honestly, I mean, thank you so much for your time, Nathan. I appreciate it. Um, this has yeah. been great. And um, I mean, if anything, it's just, it's awesome to kind of talk about because I love, I mean, Oregon feels like home to me. I mean, I love it here. And um, I think having a BDR like this is just a great reflection of how incredible of a state uh, we have and all the terrain we have that people just don't even realize exists. So I think it's going to be a great reflection of Oregon and, um, and going to really pull more ADV people into doing a little bit more adventuring. So we'll see how it goes. But um, yeah, anyway, well, thank you so much. Um, I'll be in touch. I'll keep you posted on everything. And uh, I'll see you in June at Giant Loop. So yeah, absolutely. Cool. Thanks for having me. And I oh, yeah, appreciate sure. the time with you. It was good to talk yeah, to you. Absolutely, It's nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll keep you in the loop. And um, yeah, have a good rest of the day. Okay. If you have any other questions, let's shoot them my way. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye.